Hello and welcome. My name is Lorleen Hoyt. I'm the Executive Director of the Tawar Network of Engaged Universities. The Tawar Network is a growing coalition of more than 400 universities in 79 countries around the world. And what they all have in common is that they are committed to strengthening the civic roles and social responsibilities of higher education in the communities where they're located. The Open Society University Network and the Tower Network share a vision of a global higher education system that engages all students in their communities and encourages the exchange of ideas and collective action to affect change in the world. We've been in partnership for more than a year and we've conducted a series of interviews and webinars under the banner of adapting to the new reality, civically engaged universities offer strategies and hope. And today I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to the Pro Vice Chancellor of Engagement and Place, Jane Robinson. She and her colleagues are working with external partners, including community groups, industry, local authorities, to make a positive impact on the economic and social and cultural well being of the entire region. At the heart of their work really is this idea of building partnerships and seeking to maximize the contribution that the university can make to society, both locally and globally. Jane, thank you so much for taking the time to be together today. Thanks very much, Lauren. Delighted to join you. Wonderful. Let's begin by setting the context. We've been coping with the coronavirus for a little more than a year now, and people around the world are experiencing the pandemic differently. Jane, how would you characterize the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted your region over time? Thanks, Lorleen. I, I think um, for us, we've been very aware that the pandemic has not just been a public health crisis, but has also had huge social and economic impacts. Um, I think both uh, the restrictions and, and the, uh, the series of lockdowns that we've experienced in the UK and in the northeast of England have, have sort of really impacted different groups and different sectors in, in different ways. And, and in particular, you know, we have seen that some of those uh, sectors like hospitality and, and retail have been impacted very significantly. And in the Northeast, um, we've had the highest number of um, employees who have been um, furloughed. So, uh, so they've not been able to work. And of course, in those sectors, they often um, are lower paid employees and predominantly um, women and people um, from diverse backgrounds as well. So I think we're also very mindful um, of the particular impact that we've seen on children and young people. So it, the impact of our schools being closed for some considerable time, you know, in effect, we have a whole generation who have been impacted by that. And of course, our students as well. And I think overall, um, for a place like the northeast of England, we think about the, um, the impact that the pandemic and the restrictions have had in terms of exacerbating existing inequalities. And for us as a university, um, with one of our core values around social justice, that's been something that we've thought about very hard. On the other side, I think we do recognize that um, through the pandemic, the value of frontline workers and um, those in the National Health Service, teachers, as a parent who's been homeschooling, I really value teachers. Um, but I think, you know, we've recognized that. Um, I think we've also seen the importance of the time that we're able to spend with friends and family, culture, um, the natural world. And, and I guess from a university point of view in the region, we've we've thought a lot about the, the way in which collectively we've been able to innovate and move at pace. Um, you know, moving to digital and online, um, and also things like the uh, vaccine development, where um, you know we've we've obviously played played a role. So I think a very challenging time, um, and, and but one that I hope we have, will have learned and had some positive experiences from as well. Thank you so much for that overview, and so many of us are 
experiencing similar challenges in different regions of the world. I'm sure that what you have pointed to um, will resonate with so many of our members. Um, would you dig a little deeper and, and tell us, you know, specifically about the work that you and your colleagues at Newcastle University have done to take action to mitigate the crisis? And importantly, um, how has your approach changed, changed over time? Maybe there were some initiatives that were undertaken in the first three or so months, and then, and then some learning took place, and you and you continued to adapt your approach. What can you share with us? Yeah, I I mean I think um, uh, like many um, this time last year we were very much in emergency response mode. And over time, um, we've really developed a bit of a phased approach around recovery and renewal. Although it's fair to say that um, that's not been linear. I think with many, we've ended up kind of going around that cycle as we've seen um, the second and third waves of, of outbreaks in, in in the country. But um, but yeah, the the um, our initial emergency response. I think what was really um, uh, key there was the existing depth of our um, relationship and partnerships within the city and the region. So those established links meant that we were able to respond very rapidly and we developed um, uh, the Newcastle University COVID response project. And, and just to kind of um, give a sense of what that meant in practice, we identified a number of different areas where we could um, help to respond to the immediate um, uh, public health crisis. So that ranged from research, um, for example, not just kind of the medical research that people might immediately think of, but social science research, you know, how do we understand how the lockdown is affecting older people, for example, in terms of loneliness. Um, we looked at volunteering, our students in particular were absolutely phenomenal in responding to calls for volunteers. So our medical students, for example, um, set up a program called Helping Hands, which was around um, providing shopping, childcare, walking the dog for um, health professionals who weren't able to do that. Um, we have a program in Newcastle called NEST, which is student-led working with asylum seekers and refugees. All of that program had to go online and they did a phenomenal job on picking that up. Um, we also thought about our estate and our facilities and our equipment. Um, so we were providing um, uh, personal protective equipment for health workers. We were thinking about how um, those health professionals could use our student accommodation that we weren't using um, and also medical equipment. So that was really all shifted to support the national effort. Um, just other things like online learning. Um, so we move rapidly to provide our students with online learning, but we also thought about how could that benefit the wider community? So kids and other people who were looking to have um, opportunities to learn online, um, we packaged those things up and engaged. I think our partnerships were really important at that point because we had a number of um, links and networks. In Newcastle, we have um, a number of cross-cutting deans who have specialist knowledge and networks across different sectors, whether that's business, um, whether it's the community and voluntary sector, the cultural sector, and so on. So through those cross-cutting deans, we were able to reach out and, and understand what were the immediate sort of pressing needs of those different communities during the um, immediate response. I think what we've learned kind of as um, we've gone through the last year or so is that we need to kind of shift and pivot a bit from that immediate um, emergency response to thinking about recovery and renewal. So what we've been doing there is working with our other partners in place, um, particularly our partners in local government, in um, the health service, the community and voluntary um, sector as well, but also with business to think about how can we support the um, what is happening um, in terms of recovery and renewal. So some very sort of practical work that we've been doing, working with the city on thinking about how we can revitalize a city centre that has been impacted so much 
um, around the decline uh, of retail and hospitality and how we can do that in a safe way. So one example of that is our urban observatory who's been using um, uh, some uh, the way in which we can use technology to map the number of people who are coming into the city centre. Um, and uh, we have a, a little app called How Busy Is Tune, which is the Geordie for town. So people can check to see what's, what's going on, how busy is it, how can they stay safe? So those sorts of initiatives, I think, um, have been really important. But longer term, we've also been developing a plan um, around um, our city's future uh, to try and think about those areas of growth where we can support innovation but also developing skills um, and revitalizing the, the cultural offer for, uh, for the Newcastle and the Northeast. And we've developed that plan aligned to the UN SDGs. So there are three broad pillars. One around people, which thinks about kind of what do we need to do to support people um, in a post-COVID environment, skills, um, well-being. One which is around prosperity, which is about economic growth, and one which is about planet because the source sustainability and reaching net zero is an absolutely critical goal that we need to really maintain our absolute focus on. So those plans have been in, in development. And I think that What's been really important is that those have been plans that have been co-designed between the key anchor institutions, but working very much with local communities as well. Wonderful. And thank you for using the phrase anchor institutions. I was, I was thinking that as you were speaking, such a strong example um, that Newcastle University provides in terms of partnering with other institutions and other anchor institutions to build really a critical mass of, of resources and cooperation and, and really an engine of ideas and resources for the region. Um, and many of the examples that you've provided are very uplifting examples of how universities can be nimble, can be flexible and responsive and contribute productively to society, especially during a crisis. I uh, Was it lost on me that you mentioned students and how responsive they were? We all know they've got tremendous energy, wonderful ideas and are always ready to engage. Um, are there any additional practical steps or strategies that you might share with others elsewhere? I ask because clearly Newcastle University was fairly well positioned in terms of partnerships and activities around engagement and, and probably able to put together these important programs relatively quickly when the need arose. Some other universities may be in different stages of development in terms of engagement. And I wonder if there are tips or insights that you might provide for them. One thing I picked up on, for example, was this idea of cross-cutting deans. It sounds like you have a real infrastructure in place, if you will, internally at the university that helped to make all of these programs possible. Yeah, like, I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, I, the 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 sense that um, our approach is very much embedded in what we do as a university. So, um, uh, engagement in place is is one of our our four core strategies as an institution. So, aligned to education research and also our global strategy. So those four core strategies all reinforce one another. And I think having that sense that it is embedded institutionally, that there is the kind of senior leadership, our vice chancellor, Professor Chris Day, with, uh, is absolutely committed to this agenda and of course in response to the crisis was um, I think very keen that we should mobilize our resources. And, and I think then the practical things about, um, I mentioned the, um, the Newcastle University COVID response project, having um, designated leads for each of those themes and establishing a project team, which is really a sort of task force to be able to um, 
really pivot on what we uh, what we needed to be doing as an institution and engaging with those partners, as I referenced before, I think was really important. And we did some practical things around some of our existing funding programs. We looked at whether we could, again, kind of repurpose or rebadge some of those um, uh, research and education focused programs to um, support this activity as well. So there was resource there for, for colleagues to be able to deliver. Um, we also engaged our alumni community in that and we had a fantastic response to um, looking at um, how we could fundraise for um, uh, for student hardship, which had resulted from the COVID uh, pandemic, but also research opportunities as well. And we had a great response from our alumni. And I do think that um, those partnership arrangements that we had in place, not just with the university, but with those other anchor institutions, we, we, we came round the table in terms of our emergency and resilience response with local government, with the police, with public health um, colleagues and, and so on. So I think having some of those mechanisms both internally within the university, um, but also um, how we were engaging externally and had the resources and the um, structures to be able to uh, coordinate our activity and be as impactful as possible. Thank you. Thank you for painting such a clear picture. I'm imagining this, this constellation of stakeholders and the university playing some role in, in community organizing, if you will, at a regional scale um, for its own sake, but importantly for society's sake as well. And I love that you've brought in alumni in addition to the folks who are internal to the university, the students, the faculty, the staff, the administrators, as well as the anchor institutions and all of the community partners. Um, so thank you for that brilliant picture. And also you've underscored you know, leadership, how important it is to have a vice chancellor like Van Vice Chancellor Day, who um, is dedicated to the idea of, of leading a civically engaged university um, and that your mission is really grounded around this idea. And you've pointed to this notion of flexibility as well, you know, repurposing grant dollars and being responsive. So there's quite a lot that you've illuminated with regard to Newcastle University's role. And I wonder if you've had a chance to step back or to think about um, other universities in your region or, or beyond and their role during this period of time. And, and if you have any remarks or comments that you'd like to make about the university's role in society at large during a crisis and also during ordinary times. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that I've observed over uh, the pandemic is that actually the collaboration between universities has become even stronger and a kind of recognition, I think, of the, the importance of the contribution that universities make to society, um, as you say, during the pandemic, but also um, more, more widely as well. Um, in, in the Northeast, we, we, have, um, we have a number of universities and, and we have come together very more strongly than ever, I think, to think about how we can collaborate in terms of economic and social recovery. We have different areas of strength in terms of our research um, and opportunities, I think, to, uh, to come together and to really sort of think about the difference that we can make within a region. Nationally, um, we've also seen um, launched within the, um, the last year, the Civic University Network, which is a UK based um, network, which brings together universities uh, to, to look at the contribution that we can make to place um, and to develop what we call civic university agreements, which sort of set out in a very public way, the commitment the universities have to their local communities and the contribution that they can make through their research and, and their education. And I think there is um, a, a view that there is an opportunity for us to sort of real, really build on that. And I think 
you know, the other observation I would make around COVID is that we have got a lot better at using digital technologies to learn from our partners across the globe. You know, this uh, session is a good example of that. And it's been fantastic for us in Newcastle to share experiences with our, our partners um, elsewhere in the world around the way in which they have um, responded to the crisis and the lessons that we can learn for the future. Thank you. I would say that my observations are similar to your own insofar as um, we are seeing from where we sit, uh, you know, increased collaboration between universities around the world. That was our business and, and the focal point of what we were doing prior to the pandemic, and it's really accelerated. And um, the level of cooperation is really quite uplifting. And um, part of the goal of this series is to, to really capture all of this wonderful work that is happening and to, to share it um, with partners around the world. Um, if we were to shift gears and ask, ask, I'd like to ask you a slightly different kind of question, a more personal question. I wonder what you've been doing to keep a positive outlook during this time. Um, we've focused a lot on the positive ways in which institutions may respond and contribute to society. And of course, institutions are comprised of individuals who are really struggling in, in very serious ways to protect their own health and, and to protect their loved ones. And um, you know, there's emotional and psychological elements to the pandemic, and there's no shortage of challenges that each of us is facing. And so I wonder what would you share with the audience? How have you been, you know, working to cope and to get by? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that's been um, fantastic um, has been the way in which I think as we've all moved to working from home, it's been a great leveler. You know, we're all we're all dealing with challenges like homeschooling or with cats that walk across the screen. You know, so I think we've all seen a sort of different dimension to our, our colleagues than than we have done previously, and 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 that that's been that has been, I guess, a positive. But um, I, you know, I I like many others have have missed colleagues, family and, and friends having been working from home for the majority of the la last year. And, and I guess for me, the, the way I've tried to deal with that is to, um, to get outdoors. I'm very fortunate. I live in a beautiful part of the world in the northeast of England and um, I'm able to, um, to get outside to to run to get on my bike and and for me that's the, the the time that I'm able to connect a bit with the with the outside world and and that's the thing that really sort of helps me uh, manage through the tough times. Pro Vice Chancellor, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Um, the Osun Tower Network Educational Partnership is committed to offering useful and hopeful responses to the unfolding global pandemic, and you've provided us with a number of very strong, very relevant examples for that we can share with our members in, in weeks and months to come. So thank you for that. I'll just ask one last question before we wrap up. Um, you know, students around the world are facing these challenges as well, um, slightly different than those of us who are professors and administrators. What would you say to students who are struggling to keep a positive outlook? Mm -hmm. I think we have to recognize that, you know, it has been a really tough year for students um, and also that there is ongoing uncertainty, which is which is difficult to manage. I guess my sort of um, reflection would be that the, the, the pandemic has given us a sort of renewed sense of our shared humanity across the globe and that, you know, we can learn from, from one another. And that I guess as individuals, really trying to remember that what we do, how we act makes a difference, that our curiosity, our bravery, and possibly above all, our kindness does make a difference. I love that. I love the, the way you've concluded our conversation today. Thank you again. And I'll just remind the audience that um, this recording is available on both the Tower Network and the Open Society University Network channels. Thank you. Thank you.